own Week in Geek Radio Show t-shirt. 15 bucks up to XL, $17 for 2X and 3X. That's twigradio.com. Resistance is futile. Boldly going where no show has gone before. This is The Week in Geek with David D. Squared and Brian Held. Heard live on News Talk 99.5 WRNO and the iHeartRadio app. Here are your hosts, Brian Held and D Squared. Greetings, people of Earth. This is The Week in Geek, your source for geek and pop culture news that's trending now. I'm your host, D-Squared, along with... Brian Held. Brian Held. How are you, buckaroo? Oh, man, I'm, you know, wore out from Thanksgiving. Oh, uh, stop being a pudding. Oh, come on now, no. Thanksgiving was good. We had a lot of folks come over, and then uh, we went to the Renaissance Festival yesterday. Oh, I went on Black Friday, and oh. there was, like, nobody there. It was awesome. Really? Yeah, it was, it was awesome. I right. And none of those stupid hecklers being... Would you like to buy a rose? Would you like a pickle? It's like, no, piss off, mate. <laughs> oh, jeez. hate those stupid hawking vendors, man. Yeah, well, Everybody was nice and chill. It was a good day. All right. That's cool. Well, did, did you get any great Black Friday deals at the Renaissance Festival? No, I got, I got you know, pickpocketed and bamboozled and hornswoggled even by all those stupid little games. Uh, of course you that's did. That's why you don't go with kids. Right. Of course. Yeah. All right. You want to lay out the show? Yeah. We'll kick it all off with top nerd news as we usually do. Then we have a very special guest because we fired. Scungy. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have a uh, comic book artist, uh, Sam Sawyer, who's here to talk about a new project called Salem. And I'm really excited because she's got some super awesome voice actors that are all involved in this project. So <gasps> it was super cool. Yeah. So did, did you give her your resume after the interview? Uh, no. No. Okay. Just asking. Just oh, jeez. Put it out there. And then, uh, of course, you want to talk about some uh, toys for Christmas? Yeah, right? yeah. We'll, we'll do a little bit of that, and then uh, we'll have some inspiration for our listeners as well. Fair enough. And then we'll close it all out with This Week in Geek History. But first. And now, your top nerd news stories from around the world, brought to you by the Viridian Tea Company. Find them on Etsy. And now, your top nerd news stories. Well, Brian, I find myself uh, flummoxed as to uh, what to uh, start everything off with. Do you well, want- yeah, I, I'm looking at our show notes here. <laughs> you see and, the theme? And there's so much Mandalorian in our show notes. I think we need to start with that. Well, it's been a month, all right? So, like, everybody should at least have watched one or two episodes. So, right. I mean, so and I'm, and we, you're finally caught up. Yes, yes. I finally caught up. Well, you know, it's the holidays, you know? I mean, right. So, like, after, actually, after we got home from the Renaissance Fest, nobody wanted to move off the couch, so we just watched the Mandalorian. No, call. that's cool. That's cool. I watched, finally watched uh, Alita Battle Angel. Oh really? How was that? Was that weird? Uh, it was. It was good. It was clearly left off on a cliffhanger. Like they, they kind of had that much faith in the movie that they thought they could have a, a part to do. Yeah, I mean, it just it left in a point where you could clearly see there's more to be told to the story, and <laughs> they didn't pull like a Back to the Future to be continued. No, and then like a decade or three later. No, I mean it was enough of a story to to. to be complete but it definitely left with yeah there's more to this story so i enjoyed it it was cool you know it was nifty there you go it was nifty that's glowing praise from one brian hell oh jeez all right so the the mandalorian uh look we're four episodes in now so uh, i guess we'll leave the fourth one sort of alone kind of i i I do want to talk a little bit about it because it this is a Western. I don't care what anybody says. This Mandalorian show is basically a spaghetti Western set in Star Wars. And that's not a knock because I think it's freaking fantastic. I love what they're doing with this story. Well, but the the last episode very much had the Seven Samurai. Oh, yeah. Where, you know, they come in and, and train the villagers to fight right. you know, somebody coming in. I, well, they, they also had a, a cowboy movie like that about that, too. The Magnificent Seven. Right, right. So I, there. Eh. It's... I, you know, I don't know. Like, it's cool to be here in the Star Wars universe, to be getting all these Easter eggs and all of this lore. Are you, and, are and you diff- really about to poop on the Mandalorian? I am. Oh, my God. Well, because it, it feels a bit hackneyed. I, I think I've said it before where... Hackneyed? Yes. Where it feels like these 80s-style action, you know, adventure weekly shows where it's just... it It's in and out. It wraps up way too quick. You know what I'm saying? It's just this kind of... Sort of prepackaged, 
you know, here's here's 36 minutes of of this story, but it, I don't know. It just it feels weird to me. Something feels very off about the whole deal. I mean, are you afraid? Or I mean, what are you afraid of? I'm not. I'm not afraid of anything. Fear I, leads to anger. <laughs> anger leads to hate. Hate <laughs> leads to suffering. See, Brian. Uh huh. Well, clearly, I'm suffering because <laughs> I feel like something is missing from the Mandalorian. So, uh, and and I'm I'm not just trying to like take some s- silly counterpoint to you. I'm just. I really feel that way. I, there's some. I, I. It's hard for me to to place my finger on it. Are, are you just realizing this now after episode four? Is is is? No, I've been feeling it since about episode two. Really? Should be. You should have felt it after episode one. Yeah, to a I degree. I mean, he rides a freaking horse. You know, or whatever the hell. It's a piranha looking horse thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's it's. It smacks of it, and, they, and he has to go to a, a a corral and shoot his way through, and then he gets together with a guy with a black cowboy hat, but it's really a droid. I mean, and then they find the baby Yoda. Yeah. I mean, and they, I mean, look, it goes from there where like they even use it as comedy. They use it as comedy. I mean, is that what you're more offended about? That there's comedy in your Star Wars, like no. peanut butter in your chocolate? No, I mean there could be comedy in my Star Wars, just not holiday special comedy. Right. There's, all right, you, you shut your dirty mouth. That, that, that is that is blasphemy, and you go too far, sir. It, it's canon. You go too far, sir. It, it's on the list. You go too far. All right. So where do you want to where do you want to start with the uh, man? Let's well let let's start with Yoda and Yaddle's love child. Oh God. What? I'm pretty sure you know Yoda and Yaddle must have stepped out on the uh, Jedi Order because you know you can't have family. You know, I mean, look, I mean that's that's what happens. So to anger. you know, anger fear you lose hate. your hate. Needs to suffering, you okay. know. So he, he didn't even pay attention to his own advice. Yeah, but do you think that's really what happened? Well, I mean, the Mandalorian takes place five, five years, years after the Return of the Jedi. So he would have been alive because the the whole thing about the openings, the first episode was that your your target is 50 years old okay so it's yeah. like oh the old bait and switch and then you find a baby and a little baby yoda so that means that the baby it was, was bef- al- before born, the phantom menace bef- yeah for the phantom menace so yeah. it's been around since the beginning and uh i don't know yoda uh, he was a young yoda you know <laughs> just, uh, hanging out with all those younglings you know wait no i'm not going there i'm oh, just saying God. hanging out I don't know. No. He he was still like a couple centuries old. So I mean, I'm sure, a couple but, centuries, like eight hundred, right? So yeah. right, you know. So he'd already gotten you know the wildness out of his system. So maybe it's just maybe he wanted to settle down and have a kid. Yeah, but he can't because he's he's super Jedi. You know, I mean, he, he's he's the principal of the school for God's sake. So well, he can't he can't not heed his own advice because of all the things he was preaching a little Anakin. Right. They're I, supposed I, to be I, celibate, I, right? Right. And so I'm thinking that perhaps we don't we don't know a whole lot about his uh, his race his species as a whole the, and the tridactyls is that what they're called the, the fans call them tridactyls fans are stupid well that's the the fan accepted term <laughs> i for include Yoda myself species. in that too because yes. okay. i know i'm stupid all right but uh we don't know a whole lot about that and i think maybe at some point they'll loop us in one fan theory that cropped up though as to as to why they wanted a uh, little baby yoda is that the empire is trying to milk him for his midichlorians yeah that would be terrible that would be absolutely awful then i would walk away and i would join you and your picketing and protesting of the mandalorian i haven't started picketing yet you Dave. look like you're gonna picket. <laughs> we're, not gonna <laughs> we're not gonna protest we're not gonna protest but I, I don't know. I mean, I'm wondering what, what what the deal is with this. But is that part of the stuff that irks you so? Because I mean, it seems very uncharacteristic. I mean, that's what makes a story though a, a, a hardened uh, character that you kind of know he's the lone gunman. All of a sudden, he falls for this little baby that he sees maybe some sort of you know connection to and hates the empire because they realize that he's going to do something bad to the little guy. And then you know he, he storms the fortress in essence. Yeah, I. I don't know. Maybe it's just the delivery of the story, right? Like if you compare it to say, I don't know, like uh, one of the HBO sort of streaming series like Game of Thrones or something okay. like that, where you have these longer episodes that are an hour in length and there's a greater story that's being deliver- delivered to you, right? And the delivery method for The Mandalorian is these little bitty chunks that just feel kind of goofy, if that makes sense, do you, do you, no, I no, don't, I don't get you. No, 
It, I, I mean, there's a lot of action. I mean, I can I, I get what you're sort of saying, uh, or I, guess I understand part of what you're saying, where it's like there's not a whole lot of exposition or big big dialogues between some of the characters. Yeah. I mean, because obviously the dude's got a helmet on, so he ain't going to, you know. I was actually glad he was chatty a bit. I yeah. was glad to hear him actually talk. We still haven't seen his face, which will lead us into our next topic, but not yet. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's not a whole lot of uh, – depth except for like when when he's with the other mandos and they're they're very uh religious and this is the way this right. is the way but I, I think all of this kind of lends itself to wanting to watch more though because there's all these little story arcs and little strings that they're pulling and you tell me you don't want to know what's going on with baby yoda tell me you don't want to know what's going on with the mandalorians tell me you don't want to know who the hell that stupid imperial governor or moff or whatever he was who's with dirty stormtroopers stormtroopers don't clean their freaking armor anymore i don't care if the empire you clean yourself up trooper you are dis- mis- just rah! what about all the sand troopers on tatooine like, they're on sand. They're sand troopers. It's in their name. These guys are like urban guys, and they got dirt. Where did they get the yellow dirt from, or the orange dirt? I I don't I don't know. See, these are the things that irk me. Okay, well, and, and you're absolutely right. I do want these questions answered. I just I'm I'm thinking just the delivery is really throwing me off, and and that's kind of <laughs> sort of my issue. I mean, I'm going to keep watching it. Obviously, every Friday it's they're coming out, so you know I'm going to be. Welcome to Star Wars, The Mandalorian, <laughs> Brian's version. Look, it's a little baby. I will save it. Now, let me tell you why I shall save this little Yoda baby. Is that, this is what you want? You want the more... Are, are you suggesting that I want the, Florida, you know, the just, dark and gritty Warner Brothers version maybe, of The Mandalorian? Maybe. I don't know, you want the Batman version of Star Wars now? <laughs> just, just asking. Just putting it out there, pal. Oh, dear. Jeez, Dave. Well, look, I could have gone several ways with this, Brian. I mean, it could have gone with oh. <laughs> Yoda and Yaddle hooking up inside the Jedi Sanctuary. Tonight, 7 o'clock on the Week in Geek. <laughs> oh, God. There, or, or that. I mean, I, I didn't even go down that road, you Brian. Did, you didn't. You're welcome. Thankful, You're welcome. Thankfully. You're welcome. Oh, jeez. Well, I mean, there, there were several angles I could have taken. You could have. You could have. So, I, did you want to... Oh, where someone has stolen the Mandalorian's helmet. <laughs> Little children were watching him eat, but he removed his helmet, Brian, after going on an exposition about how no one's seen his helmet since he was a child, and now it's gone. Right. <laughs> Did one of those kids steal that helmet? Dirty little kids, little little rugrats stealing we, his helmet. Are we going to find out in the people's court? We are. This is exactly <laughs> where we're going to find out. Uh, I don't know. So yeah, I did. Yeah, I did think about. Thing. I did think about the helmet thing when when he went on that whole you know tirade about hey you know I can't if I take it off I can't put it back on again right and then I took and it then, off yesterday you right know, because that he's by himself but, correct yeah, well that, but if immediately you take it off in front of someone or if someone else takes it off of you you can't put it back on again right and then he immediately takes it off to eat you know in front of an open window right I right. mean what, what the hell is that yeah that was pretty huh uh, I mean it, it, there, there wasn't a two way mirror there you know I guess kids don't count. The I don't know. Not, I mean, there was a fifty-year-old Yoda there, though. He's fifty. Right. Right. Well, maybe he maybe he was outside playing and you know trying to eat those frogs. Sidebar. Yeah. Fifty years old. How that? No wonder the species only got three or four members. You're fifty years old and you are still got the mind of a child just because you got super duper force powers. That's going to keep you alive. Hell no. No wonder his race is almost extinct. True. That's a horrible, horrible. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Evolutionary process. Yes. Just bad, bad evolution. Right. Amazing they're not right. all dead. So as a, another quick side note, I saw something pop up around those particular scenes. I think it's at the 16-minute mark of, mark of episode four. Okay. You can see in the hut where the Mando's talking to the lady, mm-hmm. you can see a boom mic in, in the background. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Wow. So You sure it wasn't just, you know... Okay, I got nothing. It's a, like space junk or whatever. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right. Space debris. <laughs> right. Right. I don't know. I did like the fourth episode. I don't want to go t- too deep into it, but I, it it had that cool Magnificent Seven kind of feel to it. And I thought I thought it was kind of cheesy and cool. What I do like though, uh, and then we'll move on from this, is that the 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 world is completely immersive. 
the aliens aren't forced upon you. Like, you know, you've got a quarry to start off episode one. You've got the uh, the, the Klaatuinians who are, are attacking the poor little shrimp farmers. And then you've got uh, the, the Nikto who are protecting little baby Yoda. All, you know, and the Nikto are the ones that are Jabba's, you know, slaves and guards, yeah. you know. And they, same thing with all these guys. And it's just like, they're putting them in there and it doesn't feel forced. Yeah. You know, it's not, you know, it's not, they save a, a, a human village, but they're being attacked. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, that's one thing that I really love because it's immersive. There's a lot of backstory. And I think that's, that's probably the best part of the show so far. I did think that what is it, episode three, where we get to see a bunch of the Mandos, especially when we see them in action, and there yeah. was like that heavy weapons Mando. <laughs> I got to get me one of those. Yeah, that was pretty tight. So It was. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of cool stuff to the show. I mean, uh, look, at the end of the day, Star Wars really is a Western action movie. You yeah. know, I mean, it really is. I mean, we, we've just, you know, immersed ourselves in it and maybe taken it too far as fans. Oh, jeez. Just putting it up there. Did, did you want to dig any more into the helmet thing? No, I think we had kind of touched on it. It's, it's weird. Well, yeah, maybe a little bit. Uh, <laughs> the the whole thing about canon is that you know in the Clone Wars and all the other uh, the, the, the cartoons, resistance, uh, not the resistance, the uh, rebels. rebels uh, you know they they meet their other uh, other Mandalorians. They all have their helmets off. She's the main character. She's a Mandalorian, but. The so the Mandalorians are tribal, so this might just be a different tribe, and they have they live by a different set of rules. Because really, you know, the Disney's continuity people would have never let this fly if you're not going to get an explanation at the end of the series at some point. Yeah, because um, was it Sabine Wren was the Mando yeah, from yeah. Rebels? Yeah, and as soon as you meet her, she doesn't have a helmet on; she's tagging a building. Right. Yeah. When when well, whenever she's not in combat, so. Yeah, I, yeah I, I I don't know. We, you're, I think you're absolutely right about the tribe thing. You know, it's probably tribally based about, you know, their helmet rules well, and what yeah, they right. do. And only one can go up at a time, but then in that same episode, they, they you know, break that rule and they all come flying out. Pew, 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 pew. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. tight. It was, it was. Yes. So, all right, uh, we got to knock out a break, so let's uh, okay. take care of our guest. Yes, uh, so when we get back from these short commercial messages, our guest Sam Sawyer will come on. Like I said, she's a uh, comic artist, and she's going to tell us all about Salem. So guys, stay tuned. You're listening to The Week in Geek on News Talk 99.5 WRNO. Every child deserves a little Christmas. And for 70 years, that's been the holiday battle cry of the Marine Corps Reserve Toys for Tots program. News Talk 99.5 WRNO is asking you to help the Marines make the Christmas dreams of a less fortunate child come true. Please give a toy to a child you don't even know. Or visit www.toysfortots.org to make a cash contribution. You'll be amazed at how good it'll make you feel. And have a Merry Christmas. Friends, is your morning tea just not your cup of tea? Then try the tea blends of Viridian Tea Company. At Viridian Tea Company, they sell blends guaranteed to make you think outside the box. With such blends as Tea of the Necropolis, Quantum Mechanics, Spider Witch, and many more, your tea experience will be out of this world. Look for the blends at Tubby and Coo's Mid City Bookshop, located at 631 North Carrollton, or on Etsy at Viridian Tea Company. Try Viridian Tea Company today. Your taste buds will thank you. You've waited for it, and now it's here. Get your very own Week in Geek Radio Show t-shirt and help support our show. These 100% cotton black t-shirts with the Week in Geek Radio Show logo are going fast. So don't wait. Go to twigradio.com and order your shirt now. Just go to twigradio.com and get your very own Week in Geek Radio Show t-shirt. 15 bucks up to XL, $17 for 2X and 3X. That's twigradio.com. Jezebel Johnston, Devil's Handmaid by Nancy Hansen, is now an audiobook read for you by Brian Held. It's a tale of a young girl from Tortuga who disguises herself as a boy and bluffs her way onto a pirate ship, chasing after her one true love, only to find adventure on the high seas. Jezebel Johnston, Devil's Handmaid is available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. Get your copy of Jezebel Johnston today. Yeah, this is Sam J. Jones, Flash Gordon, and you are listening to The Week in Geek. You better be listening. I will. I will hunt you down, and I will find you. 
This is Brian Held with the Week in Geek Radio Show on News Talk 99.5 WRNO. And I'm joined by a very special guest tonight. She's a comic artist and visual designer, Sam Sawyer. How are you? I'm doing really well. How about yourself? Um, I'm wonderful tonight. So, you know, let's let's dig in here. Now, but before, you've got some great properties that I really want to dig into, but you're fairly young. How how long ago did you get into comic art and and you know got started? So I started doing comic book art and it, like actually going to comic book conventions right around when I was 18 years old. I believe if I'm remembering correctly, one of my very first conventions was when I when I was 18 and I had just started college actually and I had forgotten like some of my I think I forgot my button maker at my dorm. And so I had to like rush back to get it. And it was just like the beginnings, you know? (laughs) Okay. No, that's cool. Now, one of the, one of the things that you've worked on in, in your experience to, to then to now is tarot cards. Tell me about, um, how you got into dealing with tarot cards. It's very interesting, very specific niche to get into. Yeah, so I've always been really, really fascinated by anything that deals with the occult, anything with magic, anything that's very, you know, self-expressive in such a way. And I actually had, I I really wanted to learn how to read tarot. And, you know, a lot of it comes with just memorization of the definitions and the cards. And for me personally, being a very visual learner, I was like, you know what, like, I'm an artist, why don't I just design my own tarot deck? And so... I did, and that really, really helped with learning how to read. And so from there, I ended up doing, a, like, two full, like, as of now, I've done two full tarot decks as well as a 28-card a oracle deck, which is very similar to tarot but just oh. a little bit different. Okay. And it's just, it's kind of become some of my favorite things to design because of the meanings that go behind each and every card. Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, um I I know that tarot cards have so much meaning in each individual aspect of the card. There just is so many small, almost like Easter eggs. So yeah. I, I would imagine it's a lot of fun to to put those things in there. It really is because you get to play with the meanings as well as like just making them your own. Like I've I've never seen a tarot deck that's ever been too similar to someone else's so that's just the really fun part that goes into it because there is so much freedom and creativity that goes into making a deck well and i think this is perfect uh that we started here because you mentioned your love for magic and and the supernatural and you're working on a project it's an animated series called salem the secret archive of legends enchantments and monsters and I've been digging into this in preparation for this interview and I'm I'm just kind of blown away at how big this project is for someone <laughs> who is so new to the industry. So give me the elevator pitch. What is Salem? Of course. So our story Salem is all about a young cryptid named Salem. And before I really go into it, I have to ask the obvious question is if you know what a cryptid is. Um, I've heard the term, but but for me and the listeners, what what is a cryptid? So a cryptid is basically any kind of animal that science can't explain. So, or we can't prove the existence of just yet. So the Loch Ness monster, Bigfoot, the Mothman, all of those creatures that are basically we have collaboratively decided that they exist. But all of our evidence is pretty much only in the source of sightings by other people. We don't have any scientific evidence that these creatures exist. And yet we've all kind of agreed that there may or may not be something to it, you know? Yeah. Um, (laughs) So our story is about a cryptid named Salem. And they have lived their entire life believing that they were a boogeyman, just like their father, who is the boogeyman. Nice. And, And so... Basically, we find out in the very beginning of our story that Salem is actually adopted and no one, not even the boogeyman, knows where, who or what they are. And so basically, uh, setting off on a journey to try and figure out who and what they are, uh, Salem teams up with two of two friends, Petra and Oliver, and they basically just set out on a big monster hunt in order to find out who they are. Wow. All right. So I, I tell you. 
what blows me away is the voice talent that you have attached to this project. Uh, former guest of the show, Rob Paulson, of course, who did uh, Pinky and Animaniacs. You've got Laura Bailey with Critical Role in Dragon Ball Z, Adam MacArthur. Uh, how, how do you, as someone starting out in the industry, right, get <laughs> this sort of talent attached to the project? How does this happen? You know, it actually, like, so when I use the term easy, I'm using it lightly because okay. nothing's ever easy, you know. But, so basically our show, we, we want it to be as legit and professional as possible. And we wanted that from the very beginning, especially me, because, you know, you want to do everything right. Right. And so, and we knew that having incredible voice actors would just be, you know, not only a game changer to like show people like, yes, like this is who we are. Like we're serious because we have all this voice talent, but also we wanted the right people for the job. And so we set, we, we made the project a SAG after affiliated project, which, you know, (laughs) loads and loads of paperwork to do that, but totally worth it. And then from there, we pretty much just sent out the auditions to a bunch of different agencies and got hundreds and hundreds of them back just from, you know, Ran, like completely random people from people that like we may have recognized the names from, et cetera. But honestly, like what I tried to do from the auditions is actually just blind pick people. I listened to the voices and I really just picked who was perfect for the role and who matched the voice that I heard in my head. Like I completely blind picked Rob, Paul, Rob Paulson. And I was like, after uh, we were like, yeah, I think I want to go with this person. It's like, oh, that's Rob Paulson. And I was like, wait. I know that name and it was just super crazy kind of actually looking up everything Rob had done right. and realizing like, this is who we just got on the project. Are you kidding? <laughs> oh yeah. No, he's phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, completely phenomenal. Like not only just incredibly talented, but just this, one of the sweetest people I've ever met. Well, it, and it's interesting because uh, you have uh, some videos where you're uh, kind of uh, chronicling the process of, of developing this whole project that that's out on YouTube. I was watching some of them earlier today. And one of the things that I thought was interesting is you mentioned about the difference in dealing with the animation community as compared to the, the comics community where, you know, comics are are much more a a male driven enterprise and the, the animated animation community is much more diverse and, from working with voice actors it seems like that's somewhat similar in that um they they work very well with one another and they they you know bring each other different jobs as to you know they know who's suited to roles very well i mean have you found working with them to to you know go like that oh totally it's just it's really fascinating because the animation world it's very linked of course to the to the voiceover world and everyone is just so incredibly amazing and everyone wants to lift each other up. There's no competition of who is better because it's such a diverse community that it's like, Oh, well, you know what? Like my voice not be, might not be perfect for this role, but I know exactly who would be. Or like, Oh, this project, like, you know, I know a really great artist for this. It's just, it's such a community and like a collaborative like project and just industry It's really, really just welcoming because like in the comic book world, chances are like all of the artists that you ever work with or talk to, they all live in different states and countries. I've worked with people that have lived in the Philippines and I've worked with people that live in my neighborhood or in another state. It's it's a little bit more isolating in the comic book world just because of how, you know, you're drawing you're drawing a comic. You're not necessarily like do, working on like this big thing that, you know, you need to be in person for, like you right. can hire someone across the country, across the world and it doesn't matter. So it's really interesting seeing a, like how different the worlds are, like getting to experience both. Oh, most definitely. So where are you in the, the process for this animated series? I know you were doing a Kickstarter um, to get some funding for season one. So where are you at? When when can we sort of expect to see this come out? Yeah, so we just we just finished our Kickstarter about two weeks ago from Thursday. And we it was really awesome. We ended up raising around seventy five thousand dollars for our first episode, just a 
you know, launch this first season and get going. And our right now, we actually are in the process of getting our writer all all secured onto the project. So, you know, and obviously, like writing is one of the most important pieces of the show. Absolutely. And so we're finishing that up this week, right before Thanksgiving. And we've already got quite a bit of concept art and development finished. So we're actually a little head ahead of the schedule that we initially thought. So my goal, which I'm not, we're still debating on an official release and an official announcement, but we would absolutely love to have our first episode either teased or finished by San Diego Comic-Con of 2020. Nice. All right. That That's our goal. You know, it's, it's such a creative space. It's such a great place to reveal projects and to get to show them off. Um, even if it's just a teaser of our first episode, we'd love to be able to show people what we've been cooking up. Oh, definitely. Now, as a comic artist yourself, are you doing like the storyboards and the principal artwork for this that animators are going to use to produce the series? Or are you actually going to do some animation yourself? <laughs> oh, man, I wish I could say I was that talented to be able to do animation. <laughs> that is a skill that I've played around with and I recognize is not where my strength is. I am an illustrator through and through. <laughs> All right, that's but, fair. You know, but but because of that, like I know where my strengths are, and I I I've done pretty much like when it comes to the main characters, I've done all of the concept art. I've had one other artist help me out with designing the monsters and the cryptids, but for the most part, I I want to help as much as I can, especially with the the what's the word like the conceptual like visual like designs of the of the property and of the story uh right. color plays a huge role in our series and so um i guess my official title on the project aside from being the creator is the art like the con not the art concept it's the visual development okay art like person right. something about something about making sure that everything looks right and yeah. also something really cool about the project too is that it's become very collaborative, like I've said. And so I get to bring in other artists and be like, you know what? You have strengths in this field. You would really, you would make it. And so it's been a really awesome process in learning how to delegate and to be almost like share those opportunities with other artists and so that's been super exciting no i could definitely see that how how you have this idea and then you're putting it down and expressing it to others and then you all are coming together as a team to make it even better it's it must be a phenomenal feeling oh it's amazing and it's it's really cool too because you get to learn how to you know you a lot of artists they spend their whole lives developing this story and it's theirs and so having getting to the point that it's time to welcome in other artists who have other opinions and other ideas and different styles is really amazing because it becomes not just yours. P other people find the heart in the project. And so everyone just my, my whole goal with the project is to create a family and to create like one big story amongst everybody's ideas. You know, it's it's not just my baby anymore. It's, right. it's really cool. No, that's fantastic. Now, Sam, unfortunately, we have to get to a commercial break pretty soon. So where can folks find out more about you, the projects you're working on, and of course, Salem, the secret archives of legends, enchantments, and monsters? Yeah, so you can find my personal Instagram and social medias and Twitters and all that at Sam Sam Sawyer. And then if you want to follow along with Salem, you can find us on pretty much every social media platform under the Salem series. All right. That's fantastic. Well, Sam, we really appreciate you taking the time tonight to spend with us. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Hang tight. Guys, stay tuned. When we get back, we're going to close out the show as we always do with This Week in Geek History. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Week in Geek on News Talk 99.5 WRNO.
Prose Productions is a leading independent publisher on the cutting edge of new pulp and genre fiction today. At Prose Productions, you'll find fiction featuring fast-paced action and adventure, larger-than-life protagonists, over-the-top characters, and tight yet extravagant plots. Prose specializes in prose books, anthologies, audiobooks, and more. Go to prose-press.com to find our monthly release schedule and more info about our great titles. Prose Productions is your first-rate publisher of new pulp fiction today. Jezebel Johnston, Devil's Handmaid by Nancy Hansen, is now an audiobook read for you by Brian Hell. It's a tale of a young girl from Tortuga who disguises herself as a boy and bluffs her way onto a pirate ship, chasing after her one true love, only to find adventure on the high seas. Jezebel Johnston, Devil's Handmaid is available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. Get your copy of Jezebel Johnston today. Friends, is your morning tea just not your cup of tea? Then try the tea blends of Viridian Tea Company. At Viridian Tea Company, they sell blends guaranteed to make you think outside the box. With such blends as Tea of the Necropolis, Quantum Mechanics, Spider Witch, and many more, your tea experience will be out of this world. Look for the blends at Tubby and Coo's Mid City Bookshop, located at 631 North Carrollton, or on Etsy at Viridian Tea Company. Try Viridian Tea Company today. Your taste buds will thank you. You've waited for it, and now it's here. Get your very own Week in Geek Radio Show t-shirt and help support our show. These 100% cotton black t-shirts with the Week in Geek Radio Show logo are going fast. So don't wait. Go to twigradio.com and order your shirt now. Just go to twigradio.com and get your very own Week in Geek Radio Show t-shirt. 15 bucks up to XL, $17 for 2X and 3X. That's twigradio.com. How do you give hope to a child in the foster care system? It starts with your heart. That tug you feel on yours when you hear that children are waiting for a stable, loving voice to speak up for their best interests. And then it becomes your time. What started out as a feeling that maybe you could make a difference becomes the difference. Change a child's story. There is a child waiting for a volunteer like you. Log on to LouisianaCasa.org to find a program near you. This is Captain Rex, Troopers, and you're listening to The Weekend Geek. Now move out! Welcome back into The Week in Geek, your source for geek and pop culture news. That's trending now. I'm yours, D-squared with... Brian Held. Well, good job on the interview, buckaroo. Thank you, sir. So, uh, all right. Well, look, uh, since we fired Scudgy, I guess this is kind of like top nerd news part deuce. I, but, I suppose. Well, I, I, I wanted... There's, after we finished Top Nerd News, we went really long on, on the uh, Mandalorian. So I wanted to get back to some of the stories that we missed. Yeah. One of which is uh, Robert Pattinson is a giant turd. <laughs> Dude, I, I couldn't believe this article that, that I read that you sent to me that Batman is not a superhero. Is this guy... Wait, wait for it. Here you go. I have to ask you about Batman. Mm. That came to you and you thought, what? Do you want to be a superhero? That was not superhero. Well, oh, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> Laughs it off. How do we classify it? It's weird. That? I always balk at it. I'm like, it doesn't count. You need to have like magical powers. I mean, to he's be got superhero. a cape, so yeah, that's a yeah, pretty yeah, good yeah. start. Yeah. The cape is there. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you that one. <laughs> So, you have to have magical powers uh, to be a superhero. So, apparently, that means all mutants are not superheroes. No, well, I guess so. Because but it, well, it also means that, you know, all of uh, Hogwarts and, uh, you know, and, and the class that he was in at Hogwarts, they were all superheroes because they had magic powers. Uh, I guess. By his definition. We're just going by his words, though. Yeah, right. No. So, uh, so, Harry Potter was a superhero. Uh, uh, oh, Harry Potter's a superhero well, movie? By, by his logic. Uh, very interesting. I didn't even think about that. There you go. It's the Harry Potter superhero saga. <laughs> there you go. It's ridiculous. Uh, look, I, I think with, with his stupidity is that uh, while all of us kind of want to see a uh, uh, the the world's greatest detective take the screen, you know, right. I mean, it might not be as sexy and 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 cool as as you know the dude with all the great gadgets and where does he get all those wonderful toys, you know, that screen worthy Batman. Uh, after what we got from the Joker, though, I-, I think, you know, it would be cool to kind of see something along those lines. It'd be like a detective movie, but, you know, I guess he, he-, he wears a cape to go detect stuff. Uh, but 
Robert Pattinson, in, in an earlier interview, said that what drew him to the uh, role was that it was the deep complexity of the character. It's like his parents got killed by, you know, a Gangster. criminal. Yeah, yeah. and so, yeah, take, take whichever origin you want to pick. Right. Uh, we're, we're killed in an alley. And thus he donned the cape and, you know, he takes all his angst out on the uh, criminal element of Gotham, of which there is a lot. Yeah. So it's a never ending therapy for Batman. Right. Yeah. Not very complex. Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I, uh, so, I mean, that's what that's what cracks me up is just that it's like, you don't have superpowers like like mutants. I guess maybe maybe in his mind, you know, being able to teleport like Nightcrawler is a magical power. Yeah, but uh, it's genetic. Right, reading right. minds, it's magic. Ooh, it's <laughs> magic, Brian. Oh, man. Yeah, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm, I was interested in the movie at first, and now seeing and hearing Robert Pattinson, I just want him to just go away somewhere yeah, and not come back. I don't know. I mean, maybe Warner Brothers will find success in doing these one shots. I, I I don't Do know. Do you really think that, Brian? Well, are, you ju- are, you, are you just pandering to the DC fans out there? Yeah, well, I mean, Joker was very successful. It was, you know. I, so who knows? Maybe maybe that's their formula. What whatever, you know. <laughs> what just the, just throw up a bunch of movies. Hope one of them will stick. <laughs> we got we got Shazam. You know, R- right? Yeah. It just it 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 kind of makes me sad because it is an interconnected universe like Marvel, right. and and they should be able to find some middle ground. You but, would think. I, I think once once it leaves, like uh, the 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 artist drawing boards, uh, yeah. is when Hollywood gets its hands on it and turns it to poop. Because, like I've said it, I ad nauseum on this show, DC's comics or, or DC's comics and and their their cartoon animated features are yeah. phenomenal. They Deep, are. great storytelling and. I don't know how they don't imitate imitate that. I mean, Jesus, just do like like, like Disney's doing live action Bambi and everything else under the freaking sun, Lady and the Tramp. Just do a live action, you know, Flash Paradox. I mean, for the love of God, that's that's a one of the best damn movies out there. Don't yeah. let don't, don't let Hollywood put their grubby paws on it. Just make it a, a non animated feature film like Beauty and the Beast, with, yeah. but no singing. No, I, I don't want any music in my DC. Oh. <laughs> Just put it out there. I don't know. That, those are the weird things that could happen when Hollywood oh, touches it. Oh, man. They turn it to poop. I, I just had this weird vision of, like, Joker and his, you know, Joker gang, you know, in the middle of the streets of Gotham, you know, all, you know, dancing with <laughs> tap dancing shoes on I'm, and stuff. I'm, try, and, I'm trying to think of just like a, a I'm lonely, so lonely. <laughs> just the Joker. He's just a lonely guy. He, that's, he just wants to be Batman's friend. That's why he always gives him these great prizes and, and presents. They just explode or they try to murder him. But deep down, it's coming from a place of love. Of course. Right. Of course. Yeah. That's So you're saying the Batman and the Joker story is one about love, Dave? That's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> Bruce Wayne and whatever his name is from the Joker run off to the Bahamas. Arthur Curry. Right? Arthur Curry. Yeah. Bruce Wayne tonight <laughs> on the Weekend Geek. Oh, jeez. Oh, man. All right. Uh, you wanted to talk about passwords. Oh. Dave. <laughs> this is a hot topic with you and I, Brian. Well, it is because <laughs> you have to change your password on a regular basis. Well, and I'm I- for iHeart Media. They, they, they're, they're, they make you do these things. Right. It's, well, it's I just stand- had to change it again. It's obnoxious. It's standard IT policy to change your passwords every 90 days. Being right. But the in guy- IT for as long as I have been. Right. Yeah. And, and I was so happy to find this article that the guy who uh, you know instituted all these crazy uh, policies that you so love and adore and worship is apologizing for it because he realized they're useless. Well, yeah, and and we've so the thing is, I love that. well, yeah, <laughs> fifteen that, years great. ago, he wrote this set of standards that at the time there wasn't <laughs> a lot of you know discussion or there was no internet research, either. yeah, into passwords and what they meant, and and he wrote this this big white paper on it, and like, well, say, white paper, I don't know what the hell is that. I didn't even, is that what it's I, it's an industry term for a document that provides information about a specific topic so like a a, a, a workbook or something or a... um it's it's just it's a a, a treatise about a particular <laughs> a treatise, about nice. a particular subject dave it you know and then I, they nailed it on every church in america if a you com- shall hear from <laughs> use quirky little figures in your password i have spoken if a if a company is going to produce <laughs> a, some sort of product or or process in the it world 
they're going to write a white paper that describes it in detail, and then you can, you know, go get it from that company and, and find out more about it. Yeah, that's kind of essentially in a nutshell what a white paper is. So, wow. Well, there yeah, we there you go. So the the thing is, what we've known for not as long as ago that this was written out, but we know that phrases like Mary had a little lamb is more secure than a password of random characters and numbers yeah, and or, or special Yeah, or if you spell out sorry using special characters like the dollar sign and uh, whatever. Right. I mean, you could throw some of those special characters, but but having a phrase right. you know, is more secure. And uh, this particular article you brought up, a a nonsensical keep- string of random characters would take three days to crack. Right. Whereas a passphrase would take 550 years. So Doug Holland, our old uh, uh, head engineer here at iHeart, God rest right. his soul, uh, one of the, like, he, he would just pick music lyrics and stuff, like sitting on the dock of the bay. Yeah. Uh, that would be a password. You know? Right. And so you just, now if you knew somebody's favorite songs, you could probably just do, 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 type them in and just hope eventually maybe you'll get one. Right. But, but you know, it's something that could be fairly easy to remember, right? Right. And and but it is of a significant length. I mean, sitting at the dock of the bay, that's a lot of characters. It would yes. take a very yes, long time to crack that. Yes, so yeah, I yeah. think I think I would rather use this one. I fart in your general direction. <laughs> okay, and, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's really for you though, too, because right. you and your password, you know, treaties making me change my password and dictating that i have to have weird characters in them i'm not dictating it dave i'm just helping you adhere no, to you're, corporate policy yeah, you're, you're enforcing it like some sort of rules lawyer <laughs> uh-huh right right oh. okay so now I, I is it time to inspire the audience uh, apparently it I is think dave. it is because uh you know uh brian really is uh an artificial intelligence we know <laughs> that he was built of spare parts at texas instruments and so here we go and now Deep Thoughts by Brian Held. Keep panicking. Facebook friends are not created to make everybody feel entertainment. Annoy individuals with money. Basing your everyday on science creates loneliness. <laughs> Try to tell yourself that you are horrible. Keep it together. Keep it together. Keep it together. Oh. <laughs> Although a wiener is a brother, a brother isn't necessarily a wiener. Oh Jesus! Before inspiration comes the slaughter. Now that's a good one. Put that on a cat poster, baby. <laughs> oh Jesus! If you want to get somewhere in life. <laughs> <laughs> You have to try to be dead. Oh, why did you give me this, Dave? Being a full-time cat lady is 1% will to power. The rest is theater. I think this one sums up this whole this segment. Is good. Never stop being weird, Dave. There you go. And that was Deep Thoughts <laughs> by local celebrity Brian Howard. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right, are we ready for a break? We are absolutely ready for a break. (laughs) All right, guys, when we get back, we're going to close it all out as we always do with This Week in Geek History. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Week in Geek on News Talk 99.5 WRNO. Friends, is your morning tea just not your cup of tea? Then try the tea blends of Viridian Tea Company. At Viridian Tea Company, they sell blends guaranteed to make you think outside the box. With such blends as Tea of the Necropolis, Quantum Mechanics, Spider Witch, and many more, your tea experience will be out of this world. Look for the blends at Tubby and Coo's Mid-City Bookshop, located at 631 North Carrollton, or on Etsy at Viridian Tea Company. Try Viridian Tea Company today. Your taste buds will thank you. 
Armada Hari, Agent H-21, is a spy fiction short story anthology about the famous dancer, seductress, and spy from World War I. Mata Hari, Agent H-21, published by Pro Se Productions, has seven rip-roaring adventure tales about the world-famous super spy that features her battling her enemies by using any weapons at her disposal. Mata Hari, Agent H-21, is available for purchase in ebook and paperback formats on Amazon.com. You've waited for it, and now it's here. Get your very own Week in Geek Radio Show t-shirt and help support our show. These 100% cotton black t-shirts with the Week in Geek Radio Show logo are going fast. So don't wait. Go to twigradio.com and order your shirt now. Just go to twigradio.com and get your very own Week in Geek Radio Show t-shirt. 15 bucks up to XL, $17 for 2X and 3X. That's twigradio.com. Jezebel Johnston, Devil's Handmaid by Nancy Hansen, is now an audiobook read for you by Brian Hell. It's a tale of a young girl from Tortuga who disguises herself as a boy and bluffs her way onto a pirate ship, chasing after her one true love, only to find adventure on the high seas. Jezebel Johnston, Devil's Handmaid is available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. Get your copy of Jezebel Johnston today. My name is Optimus Prime, and you are listening to Starscream here, and you are listening to The Week in Geek. Call me Lord. Welcome back into The Week in Geek, your source for geek and pop culture news that's trending now. I'm your host, D-Squared, with Brian Held. Now, as always, we want to strongly urge you to check out the Facebook page. We're out of Facebook jail, right? Uh, yes, we are. Okay, yes. good. Facebook.com forward slash The Week in Geek. Check out our website at twigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at Twig Radio and the Instagrams The Week in Geek. Now, how, Brian, how can people listen to this lovely show? Well, if you miss any part of tonight's show or you want to catch your favorite part again, you can always find us on Spreaker.com or download Spreaker for your smartphone or tablet or also on iTunes, YouTube, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, the iHeartRadio app. And a rest stop near you. This Week in Geek History. We're sending you back to the future! Yes! Oh my god! This Week in Geek History is brought to you by Jezebel Johnston, Devil's Handmade by Nancy Hansen, read by Brian Held. Available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. This Week in Geek History. Yes! Oh my god! Da-na-na, da-na-na, wow. I'm, I'm going to get sappy for a second, Dave. Oh. One, of, one of the items on that list of AI inspirational <laughs> things right, that we right. didn't get to is life is too short to simply be mediocre, Dave. And which is why I do this radio show with you. Self-medication never ends. Yeah. <laughs> God, that, that AI is wise beyond its years. It is. All, All right. right. First item on my list, November 26th, 1965. Gamera, a Japanese film about a Godzilla-like Gamera. turtle, is released. I like turtles. Uh, Gamera is really neat. He is full of turtle meat. <laughs> Thank you, MST3K. <laughs> All right. Um, now getting a little weird. Uh, November 27th, 1895. Alfred Nobel signs his last will and testament at the Swedish Norwegian Club in Paris setting aside his estate for the purpose of establishing the Nobel Prize after his death. Damn, he was that rich? He had millions of dollars to give out a, a million dollars each year? Yeah, uh, So he, he was like the, uh, the the Microsoft dude of, of the 1800s? I guess. And you know why he created that, right? Nope. Because, so after reading a premature obituary which condemned him for profiting from the sales of <sighs> arms... He bequeathed his fortune to institute the Nobel Prize. Oh, my so, God, he's Howard Stark. I mean, he's Tony Stark. Right. He's both. He's yeah. a Stark. Yeah, no, because he created dynamite, right? And, <laughs> and Dynamite. Right, and they wanted to use it for warlike purposes, and he, you know, because he was like, this is for construction and stuff. And, right. Yeah, and no, they, they used it for destructive means, Dave, and he was very put out about it. They, look, you know, I have unleashed Shiva on Earth, you know? Yeah. There you go. Um, I like that. I learned something. Yay! Of course. <laughs> Next item on my list, November 28th, <laughs> 2005. <laughs> the term Cyber Monday, Dave, comes Ooh. into use to refer to the Monday following Thanksgiving Day in the U.S. 
Just the term Black Friday denotes the Friday after Thanksgiving for being the busiest shopping day of the calendar oh, that's year. Why, that's why we fired Scungy. He's dead right now because oh, of Black Friday. He yeah. had to work on Thanksgiving. And, yeah, he's like probably still at GameStop. Yeah, I, I saw his dear and lovely wife, Leanne, at the Renaissance Festival without him because he was at GameStop. You know, look, sidebar, uh, I know we're wrapping up here in a second, though. But, look, I think Black Friday is going to go the way of the dodo soon because, I mean, it's it's not generating all that stuff. And now that they open on freaking Thanksgiving, it's not they're not going to suddenly call it Black Thanksgiving. They're going to call it, you know, whatever. Go shop while your family's at your house. Well, you know, sleeping on the couch watching football. I think we should vote with our wallets and stay home and I, enjoy look, I, family. I'm down with Cyber Monday, man. That's You don't have to deal with nobody, you know, and just You can shop stuff. in your pajamas. Yeah, right. That's the best part. Yep. All right, what's next? <laughs> um, Let's see. We're uh, Let's see. November 29th, 1972. Pong is the first commercially successful video game. It's released in Sunnyvale, California. Yes. Oh, that was the one where they, it was a quarter machine, and they kept filling it up, mm-hmm. and, and the guy's like, your, your machine's broke, bro, but it was, it was full of, of quarters. quarters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty Good much. stuff. All right, we got to get the hell out of here. Okay. Uh, I don't have a guest book for next week yet. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. Well, so. let's leave them all with some inspirational phrases. Rich oh. people, they love to refuse you. <laughs> <laughs> you are about to turn into an awful shapeshifter. You should try to understand the implications of that, Dave. Till next time, keep your nerd flag raised high. G F L. Oh, you did it all sexy. Catch News Talk 99.5 WRNO FM New Orleans anywhere on our free iHeartRadio app.